welcome back to another episode of the Curious Neuron Podcast. My name is Cindy Huffington and I am your host. Today we're trying something new. Usually when I do a solo, it's only audio. But as you might know, I've started now putting some content on the new YouTube channel. So I highly encourage you to visit the channel and to subscribe. I'm going to try my best to put some videos, but mostly to put the podcast videos up because I do it myself too. Sometimes I'm working at my desk and I listen to a podcast on YouTube in the background. So I thought maybe this would be helpful and a great way for you guys to be able to listen to the podcast a little bit more easily. If you are new here to Curious Neuron, welcome. I am a mom of three from Montreal, Canada, and I have a doctor degree in neuroscience. My job here with the Curious Neuron podcast is to try to share research around parenting and child development to make it easy for you so that you don't have to go look for it. Uh, I am ending season three today. This is the last episode of season three, so you have a lot of work to do in the next couple of weeks while I take a little break. Um, we This is episode 40 of season three, and just to give you a difference uh, or a comparison, season one and season two had 16 and 17 episodes respectively, and today and now this season has 40 episodes. So if you're just catching on to the Curious Neuron podcast, you've got some work to do in the next couple of weeks. I will be back on September 12th, Monday, September 12th, with our first guest of the season, Mona Delahook. And I cannot wait to share the information that she gave us around child behavior and discipline. It is beyond, I just, I absolutely love her work and I can't wait to share that with you guys. So before we get started on today's episode, which is all about daycare, um, the adaptation period or the transition period, whichever you'd like to call it, um, I would like to thank the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute for supporting the Curious Neuron podcast. Um, they are here in Montreal at the Neuro and I absolutely am grateful for everything that they do for us. Um, it allows me to be here to talk to you. So if you do enjoy Enjoy the Curious Neuron podcast, please let me know by subscribing on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts and by leaving a rating and a review. You can do that during the two weeks while I take some time off and you could definitely share the podcast with your friends. I was listening to your feedback during season three and I know that many of you said you wanted shorter episodes. So my goal, as you've seen in the past couple of weeks, is to give you some shorter episodes. Sometimes when I, re when I interview a researcher or a guest, it's a little bit harder to keep it under 30 minutes. But I do my best now to try to bring it a little bit uh, lower because <laughs> they were getting a little long. I love talking to all these people and sometimes it gets really hard to kind of narrow bring the time down because I do have a lot of questions, um, but I will do my best next season. I'm excited for all the re the people that are coming on board um, for for interviews in season four. I have a researcher that is uh, focuses on mindfulness and compassion, and that, as we know, helps um, with uh, emotion regulation and with your mental health. I want to focus on both you and your child. As you know, this is my focus for Curious Neuron. It's a more of a holistic approach where I try to focus on helping a parent nurture themselves, the ch nurture your child, and each other as a community. And as uh, Curious Neuron continues to grow, I want to continue to do this. And one thing that you know I'm passionate about is emotion regulation skills. Not just passionate about, but that's the research I dive into and what I studied a bit during my, um, not a bit, <laughs> what I studied during my own um, doctor degree. But when it comes to emotions, I think that there's a lot of, you know, of information out there that we need to learn as parents that will help us parent our child. Um, and that is why I became the co-founder of WonderGrade. If you haven't tested it yet, the link is in the show notes or below here if you're watching on YouTube. And you can download the app, the WonderGrade app for free. It is an app that will help both you and your child understand your own emotions and learn how to cope with big emotions. There are activities um, that your child can do when there's this lovable character that just makes things easy for your child to learn how to take deep breaths um, through little activities or to learn what mindfulness is. You can do that from a very young age. Then there's a the parent center that helps you understand how you were parented and how that impacted your emotions and what you are saying to your child and how that influences how they, de they develop healthy emotion regulation skills. All right, now let's dive into today's topic. Um, by the way, if you're not following us on Instagram, you could visit us at curious underscore neuron. I post there every single day and try to share all the research that I can find that will make parenting much easier for you. Again, I don't want you to Google. I want to take that part away from you, but I also want to take the research so that you can decide what applies to you and your family, what's best for you and your child, because every single parent is different and every single child is different as well. So I want you to make those decisions with the information that I pull out for you. 
Um, thank you, by the way, to all the listeners. We have a lot of new listeners this season. Uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, we started off season three with around 1,100 weekly downloads, which I was really happy about. This is only season three. But now, uh, as of this week, uh, with the last episode of season four, we are at 6,800 downloads per week for the past couple of weeks, um, something I never would have imagined. And I'm grateful for this community of parents. And I know that there are healthcare professionals um, that listen to the podcast as well so thank you to each one of you whether you're in Montreal in Canada in the states outside of there um, I know that we have a pretty good audience now and I hope this continues to grow so please share this with your family and your friends the top episodes that we had last season or this past season sorry in season three are boredom with Susie Allison which was a very recent episode that is doing really well so you guys are interested in boredom and play Um, And then we also had uh, an episode with a researcher from McGill University here called, her name is uh, Dr. Tina Montreuil, and her episode was about managing tantrums, which focused on emotion regulation skills, and she gave lots of hands-on advice. So if you have to catch up, (laughs) that's a good episode to go listen to. Then we also had uh, the episode on critical thinking with Julie Bogart, which I loved as well. Critical thinking is an important skill, and she gives us ways that we can work on this with our child, whether they're in preschool or in early elementary school. And then there was the episode that was all about the word because. That's the episode called, This Will Change How You View Your Child's Behavior. So I really encourage you to take the time to go back to these episodes and to listen to them because they will help you parent and help you understand yourself and understand your child and their behavior. And that is the goal here. All right. We are focusing on daycare adaptation periods or transitions today. And I wanted to talk about that because I have a feeling there are a lot of parents that maybe have already started doing this now with their children, usually around the start of school time. That's what it is here in, in Montreal. Um, some You'll have some new children begin daycare or some new babies that are starting daycare. And this is something that I'm passionate about because there's a lot of research around the importance of um, a slow adaptation period or transition phase to help the baby or the toddler or child, you know, build that attachment with their new caregiver, but it's not being applied everywhere. And I don't think it should be like that. I really think that this research should be implemented a lot more. Um, I still hear parents tell me that their daycare educators, you know, told them to uh, just kind of leave the baby there and 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 walk away and, and that they'll get used to the new educator. Part of that is true. They will get used to to the new educator, but we don't have to walk away and leave them there in full shock right away. (laughs) And I know with the pandemic that it made things a little bit more difficult, but I think there are lots of ways that we can work around this to make sure that we're implementing the research. So if you are a daycare educator, um, I highly uh, recommend that you do listen to this with the director of your daycare, or if you are the director, and you can email me at info at curiousnaron.com if you do want... um, a talk given at your daycare. I do give speeches or talks, uh, workshops in in schools and daycares and in businesses. Sometimes I give talks um, to parents during lunch break. So uh, you can definitely email me at info at curiousneuron.com. What I'd like to highlight here is that there will be a stress period in your child. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, when you meet somebody new, I I feel it. I I don't like meeting somebody new. I might get a little bit stressed, a little bit of that, you know, cortisol going up there. But we have to be mindful of how we're doing this with a baby. So like I said, having a very slow transition, what what does that mean? Uh, Basically, you are accompanying your child while they're meeting this new caregiver. And you're not necessarily pushing them onto this new caregiver. You're not kind of saying like, go, go, go see the person, you know, like, go give them a hug. You you don't want to enforce that or push that or call them shy. Um, It's very normal for them to be hesitant to, you know, walk towards a new person. Some might not. Some kids just like you know love these situations and it's their first day at daycare and they're like bye see you later (laughs) and they just take off and go play with somebody new every single child is different but I do want to be uh, mindful of the kids that struggle with this a little bit and I, I don't want you as a parent to feel that you've done something wrong or that they're shy and they shouldn't be shy it's a very healthy quality to have and actually a really good part of their development not good, but uh, um, an important part of their development, because you want them to develop the skills of knowing, you know, what makes them feel comfortable with a person or what makes them feel uncomfortable with a person. You don't want them to necessarily go and hug everybody. Again, there will be kids that do that. And that's okay. But if your child 
is hesitating to do that, don't feel like you've done something wrong. What you want to do is support them and connect with them, right? So uh, similar to the book, uh, The Power of Showing Up by Tina Bryson and Dan Siegel, you want to apply the same um, S's, right? So does your, is your child or does your child feel safe? Do they feel seen? And do they feel soothed, right? And when they do, they feel secure. You want them to feel the same way we want to feel you want them to feel that way with you and with this new um, educator or caregiver that's in their life you want them to build a bond with them you want them to feel comfortable and safe and soothed with them so when they're meeting them for the first time allow that time to happen if you can and this is why I'm I said at the beginning I really feel like this kind of research should be out there a lot more because it should be implemented in a lot more daycares. Um, I don't know how it is in the United States, um, but I do know here locally in Montreal, I've heard lots of parents say that, you know, they're, they're being, it's being recommended that they just kind of like bring their child to the first day of daycare and walk away. Some daycares have um, transitions, but it's a certain amount of time. It could be two days, three days of a half a day, or it could be like one hour the first day, half a day the second day, and then a full day the third day or something to that nature. Um, and, and again, that's not being attuned to the child. So the daycare systems really have to start implementing uh, more time to transition the child. Now, I know from a logistic point of view, daycares might not have the resources or the capacity to allow a parent to come in and to watch them and to have playtime with the new educator and the parent. But I think um, that there are ways to do this outside that are really mindful of a child's development and are really mindful of a child's attachment and their stress levels that happen no matter what when they start daycare. Because again, it is stressful when you start, you know, and being in a new area. So we could Zoom perhaps a couple times with the new educator or the daycares can start offering parents a picture of the child's new educator. And this picture could be placed on the fridge if it's just a picture of the educator or even better, if you can take a picture with the parent, the child and the new educator, take that picture, send it to the parent, you know, two months, a month before they start daycare and the parents put that up on their fridge. And that way, the new educator, let's say her name is Amy, um, will always become part of the conversation during the day. And then they're not as novel. It's not a new random person when they start that first day of daycare. It's, you know, Amy that we talk about. And as a parent, what you want to try to do is show that you are very comfortable with this educator. So whether you are doing this in person, where you have that adaptation period and the daycare allows you to go inside, you could, um, if your child is hesitating to come and, and play with the new educator, let's say her name is Amy, uh, you can play with Amy and you can play blocks or with the cars and vroom, vroom, look at this car go here, Amy, you catch it. And you're, you're interacting with that person and allowing your child to create that distance and allowing them the freedom and the independence to come closer when they feel more comfortable. Uh, that is a really beautiful way to kind of include your child and show them like, I'm safe with this person and, and you are too. Um, if you don't have that luxury, which it shouldn't be, um, if you don't have that ability to do that within the premises or the, the area of the daycare, then you can try to do that as best as possible with that picture on the on the fridge. Uh, and you could, you know, while you're eating breakfast, let's say you're having a slice of toast with peanut butter, you could say, I wonder if Amy likes peanut butter. Do you like peanut butter? And then just bring in Amy into the conversation as, as much as you can. If you're building a block of towers, you can say something like, oh, this, you, you built a really tall tower. Um, do you think Amy could build a, a tower as this tall? Um, and just bringing Amy into the conversation as much as you can so that when you're off to school that first day or that, that preschool or daycare, your, your child already knows her name. She's been part of the conversation for a few weeks now. And then you could bring up, you know, how do you feel today? This is for an older child, obviously. If you do have a toddler or preschooler that speaks and it's their first day of daycare, you can ask them how they're feeling about it, any hesitations, um, and, and so on. There are two things that I distinguish between um, starting daycare with a baby or if it's a, a toddler or preschooler. So with a baby, you obviously can't have all these conversations with them, but you can cuddle a bit more. You can, you know, give them a lot more affection at night and more time, one-on-one -on -one time, if you can. Um, and, and monitor, regardless of your child's age, you want to monitor their behavior. 
Are they eating uh, differently than they were before they started daycare? Are they behaving very differently before they started daycare? Are they uh, sleeping? Are their sleeping patterns different? Or are they taking more time to fall asleep? Are they waking up more frequently during the night? Um, those are our, those are all ways of expressing an emotion externally, right? When it comes to emotion regulation skills, we express them internally, uh, which is the emotion itself, right? I'm feeling sad, mad. And when I do that, maybe my stomach hurts, maybe my palms get sweaty. But then there's the external factor. Am I acting out because I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do with that? That's how I externalize it. Am I crying a lot? Am I, you know, uh, I don't know. There's different ways of doing it, right? Toddlers might have more tantrums. Um, so we do have to be mindful of how they're behaving and and not just mindful, but but kind of assess it. If we see a difference, then perhaps um, there is uh, uh, more of a reaction to the transition of starting daycare. Again, this is all not a bad thing. It's just that I want parents to be aware of it so that you can say, you know, I've noticed that my child is, is acting, out, uh, acting out a lot more or that my baby is crying a lot at night. Um, so I, I think I need to, you know, do something about that, whether it's, again, like I said, spending more time with your baby, cuddling with them, you know, more kisses and cuddles when it's time to start daycare in the morning um, because they can't speak and express themselves, right? So it'll come out very differently. When it comes to a toddler, if their behavior is very different after you've started daycare, don't discipline that, you know, just be aware that that emotion is always or that behavior is communicating an emotion. So what can you do um, within your home? You know, can you again spend more time with them, a little bit more playtime? Can you have conversations uh, about feelings and emotions? What's great with a toddler or preschooler? is that you can use play to create scenarios. So you can use all these stuffed animals and then you say, oh, you know, this yellow bear is, is uh, uh, you can pretend you're playing daycare, right? And your child's a daycare educator and yellow bear is really nervous and worried and, and doesn't want to start daycare or is worried to go play and, and doesn't want to. So yellow bear is sitting in the corner and and then you create that scene and then you can ask your child, well, you're, you're the daycare educator um you know what can you do to help yellow bear feel a bit more comfortable and then your child might give you a response or your child might might say i don't know um and then you can suggest things like maybe if you ask yellow bear to come play with you or maybe if you ask yellow bear to read a book with you something you know of that nature and that way when you're going to daycare either the first morning or you know a couple mornings into it when you notice your child's behavior is changing you could say something like Remember when Yellow Bear was really worried about starting daycare uh, when we were playing daycare? Well, it helped Yellow Bear to read a book with this new person. Maybe you could sit beside if you don't want to sit, you know, on the lap of this new person and you could sit beside them and and read a book with them. And maybe that'll help you uh, get more comfortable with them. So you're using the situations of when you were playing with um, stuffed animals and you're bringing that into your conversation with your toddler or preschooler because they understand that so that's a really important uh it's a really important way to kind of bring in emotions and, and name different emotions disappointed or frustrated worried or scared uh, it's not just happy mad and sad happy yet yeah. <laughs> it's not just those three emotions right there are a lot more and we want to incorporate those words into our child's vocabulary regardless of how old they are not only do we want to incorporate the words but we want to tell them what we want to help them discover not tell them uh, we want to help them discover what it feels like to have these emotions when you're worried how does it feel for you do you feel something in your belly? Does your head hurt? Do your palms feel sweaty? You know, how, how, what does it feel like to you specifically? And then once you know what it feels like to have this emotion, what do you do with it? So when you're frustrated, should you throw toys? No, uh, but you can show your child different ways that they can regulate these emotions externally, right? Uh, instead of just throwing a toy or a tantrum or, or, you know, hurting their sibling, perhaps when they're frustrated, you want to give them those tools and model what you're supposed to do when you're frustrated. Notice that keyword model. <laughs> That's the hard part. <laughs> so what you want to make sure is that when you are frustrated, that you are modeling what you would like them to do. It doesn't have to be 100% of the time. We're not perfect. We're human. Um, and same thing for me. It doesn't, you know, I, I always put it out there that I can be, uh, I can have a PhD in neuroscience and still lose my SHIT <laughs> because I'm human. So we have to be mindful of that and, and allow ourselves to, to have moments where we just lose it. 
but on average, you do want to practice emotion regulation skills the same way that you want your child to practice these skills. You want to show them what you do when you're disappointed, when you're when you're mad, when you're frustrated, when you're sad, um, and that there are different degrees of expressing these emotions. So that is the most important part when it comes around emotions. Now, now that your child has become comfortable, um, maybe the next question you have for me is how long will it take for my child to get comfortable with the new educator? So there was a study that showed that it can take up to six months. <laughs> the reason why I want to bring this up is because you might have a child that adapts within two minutes, or you might have a child and you're two months into the new daycare and you're wondering why is my ch- why is my child still crying to go into daycare? Um, it's because for some kids it takes a long time. This is a big transition, a new caregiver, somebody that they have to feel close to. Now, it doesn't mean that you know all kids will will adapt with six months. It could take a couple of weeks. There's a it's a big range, but it's just to say that in this study in particular they found that adaptation period, and and by the way, that study will be in the show notes, but they found that that the adaptation period could take up to six months. And the way that they measured adaptation was through stress levels. They measured cortisol levels in the children, in in the preschoolers and the toddlers, and they wanted to see how long does it take before a child can arrive at daycare in the morning and not have elevated cortisol levels or stress levels because on average, they were seeing that it can take up to six months for some kids um, to to show up at daycare and not feel any stress at all. And that's when the end of the adaptation period happens. And what was interesting in this study was that a child who isn't crying showing up at daycare didn't necessarily not have any stress. They found that children who weren't crying also had elevated cortisol levels. So it's not a sign that everything is okay if our child is not crying. What is a sign is if we're not seeing any behavioral issues or changes in patterns, like I said, the sleeping or the eating. If we're not seeing any of that, there was a really wonderful and perfect adaptation period, which is just lovely, but that's not the reality of all the children. So we have to make sure that we are aware of what's happening after. And by the way, on average, when even if a child has stress levels when they start daycare, Um, by noon it goes down so it's not stress the entire day it's once they get comfortable with the routine and the the the, uh, caregiver and the people that are around them if you are starting a new daycare I really encourage you to ask about the turnover turnover rate of educators you want it to be as low as possible and if it's a daycare that says well you know we have people really leaving quite often if you can Um, go to daycare where it's more consistent because every single time your child will have a new daycare educator, it is a new adaptation period. And all of this, by the way, that I'm talking about applies whether it's daycare, a home daycare, uh, at school daycare, or a nanny. This is a new caregiver in their lives and you want them to uh, to learn to be more comfortable with them. And again, it's not through pushing, but it's by seeing you be comfortable with this person and allowing them to come on the, at their own pace. Um, you also want to ask the daycare, what do they do in terms of emotion regulation? So it's not just about like talking about emotions. Like I said, are they teaching them what it feels like to have certain emotions? Are they teaching them what uh, to do when you experience cer- certain emotions? Um, And how do they discipline or how do they allow emotions to be expressed, right? So if a child is mad, is this uh, perceived as being uh, uh, bad behavior or is this, uh, you know, uh, understood to be an emotion and that you have to feel, um, you know, empathy towards this child's emotion and that you have to connect with them? How are they doing this? Um, And then the, the how are they disciplining when they do if your child Um, doesn't follow certain rules what is their method of discipline are they teaching right so are they whether it's a child hitting are they teaching what not to do and what they should do are they contrasting that to try to teach your child or is it a timeout corner I'm not against timeout corners or I don't I don't implement it within my home I never have with my three kids Um, but I'm not fully against it what I've seen in research is that it's usually not implemented very well and consistently within homes, which is why it doesn't always work. But I think that there are lots of other ways to discipline a child. So that's why I'm not fully against it, but I don't implement it because I think that 
um, there are many other ways that you can discipline a child without having to put them in timeout. If somebody has been injured, I, you know, this is what I would do in my own home, take the child away from the situation and remind them that I'm trying to keep them safe and the person that was with them safe. Um, but besides that, it becomes communication, explaining what's right, what's wrong, why shouldn't you have done that? And why did they do that more than anything else? Why did they do that? And, and what was the emotion underlying that? so that I can work on their emotions primarily and teach them what to do when they're feeling that emotion. Because most of the time, when there's a big behavior, there's an underlying emotion under it, which I think we've spoken about um, ad nauseum here on this podcast. So, but, but I will talk about it again in the next season, definitely, because it's just something that's so important to really understand all of this. That is it for today's episode. I hope today's episode was helpful to you. If you know somebody who's starting daycare or, or know somebody whose child is starting daycare, please share this episode. Thank you to all of you for following me this season. Uh, this, I can't believe, is the last episode of season three. We are ending the summer now. Um, this is the 40th episode of season three. And I will see you in September. Remember to follow Curious Neuron on Instagram at Curious underscore Neuron. You can listen to the podcast on iTunes, on Spotify, on Audible, on Google Play, on Amazon, something. <laughs> anywhere you listen to podcasts um, and you can now watch the videos I will continue to upload videos throughout the summer and September you can watch them on YouTube so please subscribe to the new YouTube channel and uh, show us some love and I will see you next time thanks everyone have a good summer bye